Seems to be that more and more churches, biblical preaching is being de-emphasized and marginalized. In many churches, there's not even a pulpit. There's not, a, there's not this. This is called a pulpit, for those who, of you who wonder what this is. And uh, in many churches, they don't have it. The platform is being replaced by a stage where performers entertain the audience, and this is seen to be a barrier to being a cool communicator. In fact, the biblical preacher is now being replaced by a cool communicator. It's very interesting. In the time of the Reformation, at the center of the church, in the medieval church, there was the altar. That's still the case in some cases. And one of the things the Reformers did, and did very wisely, that they put at the center of the church a pulpit. Why was that? Because they believed that one of the characteristics of the true church was the preaching of the Word of God. So it's pretty tragic when this now is being removed and replaced by entertainers. John Hanna was a professor of uh, systematic and uh, historical theology at Dallas Seminary when I was there, and uh, he wrote this, and uh, he's writing as a historian, Christian historian. He says, the average fair on Sunday mornings seems more concerned with demonstrating the usefulness of the Bible in the management of our personal affairs rather than declaring the person of the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, this has turned into a kind of do-it-yourself manual to make life more comfortable for ourselves, rather, he says, than declaring the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, the situation today in many churches is that if you want to see what is superficial and trendy, go and find a successful evangelical church. He says, we have allowed our pulpits to become therapeutic dispensing pills to relieve temporal discomforts while the great eternal issues are too politically challenging to mention. That's written by a church historian. Don't know if you agree with it or not, but there it is. Well, as Rob has said, this evening uh, we begin a new series, Sunday evenings and Sunday mornings, on the priorities of ministry. And I have the privilege of beginning the series tonight uh, with the subject of the priority of preaching, something very dear to my own heart. As I said this morning, throughout uh, the month of February particularly, uh, my fellow pastors uh, will preach on priorities that are dear to their hearts, starting with Nathaniel Pierce next Sunday morning, who will preach, preach on the priority of the family, and then Jim Pyle will preach in the evening on the priority of care. So let me ask you to open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is a passage I come back to time and time again and was instrumental in my own call uh, to full-time ministry. Because from 2 Timothy chapters 3 and 4, I want to give three reasons why preaching in the church must be a priority. And these three reasons come from this passage. First of all, I want us to say that preaching is a priority, or must be a priority, because of the current conditions of our society. Listen to Paul in the first five verses of 2 Timothy 3. He says, understand this. Now, he's writing his last letter. He's in prison. He's writing to Timothy. He's about to die. So, there's an urgency in this letter of 2 Timothy. He says, understand this, Timothy that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Now listen to his description and see if any of this resonates with you. For people will be lovers of self. First thing he says, we put ourselves at the center of our world. We are little kings and queens in our little world. Lovers of self, lovers of money, <clears throat> materialistic, proud, arrogant, abusive. It's amazing how many people are still abused. As a pastor, we meet with people, some of you are in that category, who have been abused as a child, perhaps abused by your own parents, abused by a teacher, abusive. 
disobedient to their parents. We're told in the public school one of the big challenges is discipline. When I was at school, there was no such challenge. Our teachers had a belt, and if you misbehave, punishment was immediately administered. I'm not advocating that we return to those days, but we were taught to obey our parents. Uh, today, speak to a teacher in a public school here in Mecklenburg, and they will tell you this is very difficult as they're trying to teach children. They're disobedient, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. How many of us say thanks for anything? We are very, very much concerned with entitlement, aren't we, even as Christians? A sense of entitlement, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous. Think of it in the field of politics, the slander that goes on today. Without self-control, brutal, not loving good. Think of the brutality of Hamas. In 2023 that occurred, October, brutal. Not just Hamas, in our own country, the brutality that there is. Not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. Here it is, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Do you think that describes modern America? Lovers of pleasure, that is first, isn't it? Even among Christians, we have our pleasures rather than lovers of God. Having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. Now, Paul, as he develops this, is going to talk about the preaching of the Word. So, I'm saying, first of all, preaching must be a priority because of the current conditions of our society. We are living in very difficult times. We are in the last days that was true in the first century. The last times are between the first and second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we look at this passage, we shouldn't be surprised <clears throat> at the increased worldliness, the increased love of self of the world, of pleasure, of money. Our society, yes, here in the United States, is on a downward spiral. We are being desensitized to sin. This past summer of 2023, uh, we looked at the book of Jeremiah, and several times in the book of Jeremiah, he says to Israel, you don't know how to blush. That's where we are, aren't we? With things in videos, social media, television, that our parents and our grandparents, certainly mine, would have been scandalized. And we sit with our family with these huge screens and watch it, and we do not know how to blush. Left to ourselves, we do not seek God. We're enmity with God. We hate God's Word. Satan is a father of lies and always opposes the Word of God. So, a church which is concerned with preaching the Word of God is going to be opposed by our enemy himself. In a world of lies, evil is called good. Good is called evil. And the task then of the preacher of the Word of God is urgent. You can sense that in Paul. He's speaking with an urgency, with a priority. Evil speaks with a very, very loud voice in our society. So, the preacher of the Word of God must be urgent. In this battle against evil, we need not a butter knife. We need the sword. We've got the sword. The sword of the Spirit, and we need that in biblical preaching. God's voice must be heard. Because of the difficult circumstances that Paul enumerates in the last day, it is imperative that the Word of God is heard, the voice of God. We sang it, speak God. We believe that God has spoken in this book, and it is imperative that we hear it and that our society hears it. Now, what are some particular challenges of our society? Relativism. The vast majority of the people you speak to have bought into the view that there is no absolute truth. What's your preference? What do you like? What makes you feel good? 
truth becomes a personal preference. The common philosophy is it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere. Truth and error, right and wrong, are determined by the individual. There are no absolutes, no objective reference point. What we feel, what we think, what we experience becomes the source of our authority. How foolish. And so people say, how can it be wrong when it feels so right? And if it feels right, it must be right. What have we done? We've set aside the Word of God, and we've inserted ourselves. Self is at the center of our world, and that has replaced divine revelation. So against the constant background of relativism, there is an urgent need for biblical preaching and teaching. The psalmist says in Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Do you get it? God's word is firmly fixed in the heavens. The challenge of relativism, what about pluralism? You can say to people that Jesus is, their, is your Savior, and they will accept that. They'll say, hey, that's pretty cool, man. That's wonderful. But when you explain that Jesus is the only way of salvation, that He is not a way, but the way, the truth, the life, that salvation is found in no one else, as we saw uh, this morning, and listen to Peter in, in Acts 4, verse 12, then there is a very strong pushback. What's the accepted wisdom of our society? All roads lead to God. Pick your own way. How foolish. Jesus says there's only two ways. There's a broad road that leads to destruction. There's a narrow way that leads to life eternal. What about tolerance? Tolerance now is the highest virtue. You can believe anything, live any way you want, have any lifestyle, and it doesn't matter. We tolerate everything and anything except the truth. I've said before, the best, the most common known verse in the Bible now is not John 3, 16. It's Matthew 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. <laughs> Taking it from its context, of course, tolerance of sin is not a virtue. Yes, we're to be kind. Yes, we're to be understanding. But God in His Word has spoken, and He gives us not suggestions, not a few tips to help you live a comfortable life. He gives us commands. We saw that from First Peter, writing to Christians, we are to obey the truth. Relativism, pluralism, tolerance. What about the entertainment syndrome? Neil Postman wrote about amusing ourselves to death. He wasn't a Christian philosopher, but I think many churches have unwittingly bought into the entertainment philosophy. We've got to copy the world, its methods, to be cool, to be trendy, to be cutting edge. We've got to think outside the box, although interestingly, that a lot of their worship begins in a box, in a black box. So the atmosphere can be, trolled, can be trolled by high tech and high noise. Success is judged by budgets and numbers. Biblical truth is replaced by make me feel good, inspiring stories, fuzzy sentimentalism, moralism. People today go into church, they want an experience. It's like going to a pop concert, isn't it? We want to experience it. We want to feel it rather than coming, as we saw this morning, to worship God. Rather than coming and saying, as we just sung, speak, Lord, I need to hear you. And so the church, instead of being countercultural, reflects the culture, particularly the pop culture, hence the need for the priority of biblical preaching. What about the challenge of biblical illiteracy? An older generation was instructed in the stories and truths of the Bible. Sadly, the vast majority of the Americans, including regular churchgoers, are pitifully illiterate when it comes to their Bible. We used to have people carrying their Bibles when they come to church. Now there's more people carrying their Starbucks cup than carrying their Bible. Isn't it true? Not long ago. Where have all the Bibles gone? People complain you don't have the Bible in the public school. That doesn't bother me so much 
as not having a Bible in church. Why is it that people are amazed when they come to Calvary Church, they'll say to me afterwards, you actually asked us to open your Bible. Amazing, isn't it? A preacher with a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, if you're not preaching the Bible, what are we preaching? So we have a generation that don't know their Bibles. We know more about movies, pop culture, sport than our Bibles. So here's the first thing I want to say. Preaching and teaching the Word of God must be our priority at Calvary Church because of the current conditions of our society. I love the way how Isaiah begins his prophecy in Isaiah 1 verse 2. He says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Don't you love that? In other words, be quiet. Listen. Stop talking. God is going to speak. Give ear. All of the heavens, God has spoken. So we have as one of our themes, read your Bible daily. I plead with you to open this book. Whether it's 10 minutes or 15 minutes or 20 minutes, open your Bible. Take one of the Gospels. Take one of the Epistles. Read the Psalms. Read some of the historical accounts of the Old Testament. Read the book of Acts and see the early church. And as you read the Word of God, say, speak to me, Lord. The psalmist says, the entrance of your Word gives light. So, the priority of preaching, first, because of the current conditions of our society. Secondly, Paul is saying, preaching is a priority because of the character of the Word of God. Chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the well-known verse. Let me read it to you. All Scripture is breathed out by God, is inspired by God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The Bible is breathed out by God. It's inspired by God. It has its origin in God. Yes, God used the human vessel to communicate His Word to us so that inspiration guarantees that the end product that we have is the Word of God. So the Bible doesn't just contain the Word of God or witness to the Word of God. It is the Word of God. All Scripture, Paul is saying, is God-breathed, the breath of God. Not wonderful that you can sit down in your home or your backyard or wherever and take out your Bible and realize this is the very breath of God. That means when the Bible speaks, God speaks. God's voice is heard. And surely in the church of Jesus Christ, God must be heard. You've got your ideas, I've got mine. You like to have a good time, I like to have a good time. But when we come to worship God, we are praising God, and then we are listening to God speak to us, that God speaks to us through His Word. It is the Word of God. Truth is not reached through dialogue, not through human wisdom, not through some kind of spiritual uh, brainstorming, not through therapy, not through consensus building. Truth, we believe as Christians, is revealed. It comes from God to us. God has spoken, and has spoken in His Word. Why then would preachers want to give their personal views, their opinions, rather than God's? Have we lost confidence in the Word of God? Psalm 138, verse 2, for you've exalted above all things your name and your Word. So what do we do? He said, at home, you open your Bible, and you pray. Lord, speak to me. Give me understanding. You go to your Bible study. What are you doing? I hope you're studying the text of Scripture. Not your thoughts on it. People say, well, let me tell you what it means to me. I'm not really interested in what it means to you. I'm interested in what it means. What did the author mean? What is the intent? What is Peter actually saying? What you think and I think are really immaterial. So we study the text of Scripture. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and then 
having seen the text of Scripture, we prayerfully consider its application for us. What does this mean this morning that we are the household of God? What does it mean that we are a royal priesthood? How does this impact us here in our situation? How does this verse relate to me as a husband? How does it relate to you doing business and so on? We prayerfully ask God to give us understanding and through His Spirit that this living Word is applied to us because it's relevant. And Paul has said in the preceding verses that without the Word of God there is no salvation. Isn't that what he says, verse 14 of chapter 3? Timothy, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. That is very important. I remember a man in the last church came to me and said, John, you know, uh, I love your preaching, but he said, uh, you got to say something new. You got to be new cre more creative. I thought, well, that's a pretty dangerous statement. I can be very creative. I can say something new. But why would I say something new? Why would I say something creative if it's not based on the Word of God? He felt we should go outside of Scripture, make this more interesting. No, Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, you heard the Word of God from your mother and your grandmother. You also heard it from me. What are you to do? You're to continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. He said in verse 10, you followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and suffering. We would say in today's vocabulary uh, that Paul was a mentor to Timothy. He not only taught Timothy the Word of God, he was an example, a living example. Now, Timothy, I'm soon going to die. I've fought the good fight. I'll soon be with the Lord, and I want you, Timothy, to come up with something new. No. Continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed. That's what we want at Calvary Church. As you go to a Bible study, as you go to your life group, we're not in for, into brainwashing. We don't do that at CDC or CCA or in our children's ministry or youth ministry. We're not brainwashing people or children. We're giving them the truth, and we want you to firmly believe it. So this is a matter of conviction because you know it is the Word of God knowing from whom you learned it. Godly mother, godly grandmother. And from childhood, you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. What are they able to do? Which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The Word of God must be heard, it must be read, and Scripture gives us the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus quoting Deuteronomy said, we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes, proceeds, present tense, that comes from the mouth of God. It is life-giving. We thought this morning of the living stone which gives us life. How can we hear this without someone preaching? That's Paul's question in Romans 10. How can they hear without a preacher? No, for people to believe, the gospel must be preached. Before there is a believing, there must be a hearing of the Word of God, an understanding of the Word of God. And the divine means of salvation, then, is through the proclamation of the Word of God. That's what Paul says to Corinth. As I came, the only thing I did, I preached Christ and Him crucified. I realize some of you think it's foolishness. For some of you, it's a stumbling block. Yes, but to us who believe, it's the power of God and the wisdom of God. And therefore, the cross of Christ must be at the center of our preaching. We must preach Christ. We are followers of Christ. Salvation is found in Christ and in no one else. So without the Word of God, there's no salvation. But also without the Word of God, there's no spiritual growth. Back to verse 16, 2 Timothy 
All Scripture is breathed out by God, and it's profitable for teaching. You need to be taught. I need to be taught. That means we've got to sit and listen. It's difficult for us. Sometimes we want to argue. Remember when I went to Dallas uh, Seminary, I realized that uh, Americans interacted with the professors a little differently from we did in Scotland, where you rarely challenged the professor unless you were very, very smart because he would put you in your place. But a professor who'd been studying and teaching for years would begin to teach, and somebody's in the front row putting up their hand and trying to argue with the professor. And I'm thinking, I'm paying all this money, and then we hear from this student. I remember Dwight Pentecost saying to a, a student who was getting a little bit argumentative, he said, you'd be a very, very poor disciple of Christ. Remember Peter wanting to speak on the Mount of Transfiguration? <laughs> Jesus says to him, no. The voice comes down from heaven. Listen to him. To be taught, yes, there's a time for questions. There's a time for dialogue. But there's a time to sit and listen to the preaching of the Word, to the teacher. And certainly, as you open your Bible quietly in your home or your car or your office, to quieten your heart and listen to God. So, God's truth is essential for spiritual growth. It's, re- it's also profitable for reproof, for correction. You go off course, don't you? Or am I the only one that does that? You begin to slightly go. A little bit of the hardness of heart, a little bit of bitterness, a little bit of a critical spirit, a bit of unholiness is beginning to creep into your life. And then you're confronted with the Word of God, and it, it, you are corrected. You are reproved for training in righteousness. We've got athletes, even as I speak, playing big games. They have been trained. They don't go onto the field wondering, now, when this ball is snapped, what do I do? Oh, let me think. They're flat on their back. No, they are trained. They've been in the gym. They've listened to the coach. They know exactly when that ball is snapped, exactly what they must do. They are trained in righteousness. This is what the Word of God does. We need to spend more time in God's gym. You work out? That's great. You need to work out in God's gym, in the Word of God. So there's a training in righteousness. You will never be adequately prepared for a good work. You'll never be spiritually mature apart from the Word of God. And by saying the Word of God, I don't mean just getting knowledge. If you're smart, you can accumulate knowledge. Unbelievers can accumulate knowledge. I'm talking about maturity. So you hear the Word of God humbly, you receive it into your heart, the Holy Spirit convicts you, and it is then practiced. Great Commission, teaching them, doesn't say just teaching them, teaching them to observe all things I command you. We have to observe the Word of God, and so we mature. In his book, The Contemporary Christian, John Stott writes, The churches live, grow, and flourish by the Word of God. They wilt and wither without it. Although we rejoice in the statistics of church growth, we have to admit with shame that it is often growth without depth. There is much superficiality everywhere, and I am myself convinced from observation that the low level of Christian living is due more than anything else to the low level of Christian preaching. To be sure, it is the Holy Spirit who renews the church, but the Spirit's sword is the Word of God. Nothing, it seems to me, is more important for the life and growth, health and depth of the contemporary church than a recovery of serious biblical preaching. I agree. The priority of preaching. First, because of the current conditions of our society. Third, second, because of the character of the Word. Third, finally, Preaching is a priority because of the call of the preacher. Look at chapter 2. Sorry, chapter 4. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now, notice how serious Paul is. 
I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom. Preachers, teachers, are you listening? Think how serious this is. Here's the charge. What do you do? Verse 2, preach the Word. That is the Word of God. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. God calls His servants to preach the Word. If the preacher does not believe that he's been called to preach, there will not be an urgency in his preaching. It will not be a priority. Paul says, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. The preacher, the preacher then is under a strong sense of divine compulsion. This is a divine calling. This is a divine priority. And Paul is giving young, young Timothy this solemn charge, preach the Word. You can sense his passion. You can sense the urgency, the priority that the preacher is called by God. He's commissioned by God. He's accountable to God. Therefore, Timothy, you've heard the Word of God. You were taught it by your mother and your grandmother. I taught you. I passed it on to you. I want you to continue to do this. I'm about to go. I'm about to die. And I'm asking you, I'm making you this charge before God and His appearing. This is what I want you to do. Preach the Word. Has this been repealed? I don't think so. And in the age of pragmatics and techniques, preachers, we need to get back to the call of God on our lives and preach the Word of God in season and out of season. And as I was looking at this text during the week, I thought God in His grace called me to be a preacher, a preacher of grace, a shepherd of souls. And as I look back on my life, I realize it was God who called me. In my flesh, I would never, ever have chosen to be a preacher or a pastor. I mean, who would do that in the right senses? It's a very unusual world. It's an unusual life to be a preacher and a pastor. I'd rather have been an attorney. I can work hard. I can make money. I can enjoy it. And I've only got, as long as I keep my client happy, it's okay. As a pastor, I've got to keep happy three or 4,000 people. It's a little harder. You say, did God call you? Yes. I had no intention of being a preacher, absolutely none. Good thing I talk about it, and she jokingly says, or maybe not jokingly, if, if she'd known I was going to be a preacher, she would never have married me. That may have been true. But here I am working hard as an attorney. Some of you have heard my story, my story. I'm not going to repeat it. But in a series of circumstances, very quickly, my life was changed. And God, through His Spirit, called me to preach. People were astonished. My colleagues and others told me I was, I was, I was committing suicide from a career standpoint. It was utter foolishness to do this. Some of the elders in the church where I, I was said, John, you know the Bible. You don't need to go to seminary. You can continue to be an attorney and, and also serve the Lord, as indeed I was doing. And I said, no, I know myself. And this is what God has called for me. It's amazing, isn't it, how God gets our attention? And for me, this is the greatest of privileges to stand at pulpit like this and say, let's open God's Word. Let's see what God has to say to us. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the Welsh preacher, said, the work of preaching is the highest and the greatest and the most glorious calling to which anyone can ever be called. Spurgeon states, we can't play at preaching, we preach for eternity. Do you know this morning there were people sitting here I know who were outside of Christ. Some of you may be sitting here, and you are not yet surrendered to Christ. You're not yet saved. And as a preacher, 
My responsibility, my burden, is to tell you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Because as Peter tells us, as we learned this morning, that there are those who obey and receive salvation, and there's those who reject Christ and receive condemnation. As a pastor, I take funerals, took one on Friday, just reminded of the brevity and the fragility of life. That some of us sitting here think we're in good health. Tomorrow morning it may be completely different. That life is brief. Eternity is sure. And the preacher, as it were, stands between heaven and earth and urges people to turn to Christ. That God in His grace has sent His Son to save you, to redeem you. But we have hard hearts, and we resist it, and we fight it, and we put it off. And so someone could be here this morning. Someone could be here this evening. Maybe because your children are in choir or some or other circumstances bring you here and you're without Christ. As a preacher, my responsibility, my burden is to tell you to trust Christ. So the preacher, Paul is saying to Timothy, must be courageous to preach the Word in season and out of season. People's hearts are hardened. People sometimes don't like the Bible. People tell me I speak too much about sin. Uh, they say if I condemn sin, uh, John, you're being very unloving. There is opposition to the Word of God. Notice what Paul says here in the first century to Timothy, verse 3 of chapter 4, for the time is coming that time has come, when people will not endure sound teaching. They don't want the Word of God. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, that the congregation chooses the kind of preacher that they want. Verse 4, will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Paul has already told Timothy in chapter 2, verse 15, that he is to rightly handle the word of truth. Not my ideas. This is the truth. People don't want to hear it. But as for you, Timothy, be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So, preachers are not puppets. We're proclaimers. We trumpet the Word of God. So, this is one of our priorities. In fact, I would say the priority of preaching and teaching is foundational to everything we are and do at Calvary Church. We must never allow pop psychology or marketing or pragmatic techniques to define our mission, our message, or our ministry. We're committed to preaching and teaching the Bible, the Word of God. We believe in the inspiration of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, the authority of Scripture, the sufficiency of Scripture, and the relevance of Holy Scripture. Therefore, if that is true, and it is, preaching and teaching the Word of God must be our priority. It's through the preaching of the Word that souls are saved. It's through the preaching of the Word that believers are brought to maturity. We must proclaim the whole counsel of God in the power of the Spirit, and may Calvary Church always, in God's grace, be a church which stands uncompromising on God's truth and always preaches the Word from this pulpit. And I say to you that you as a congregation have a responsibility. Why is it that some churches go into liberalism? You can blame the preacher, but you also must blame the congregation that allows that to happen. At the time of the Reformation, when the Bible was being translated into German, into uh, English, and, and French, and so on, and when people were able to read the Bible for themselves and discovering the truth of the priesthood of believers, as we saw this morning, it was described as a dangerous idea. It was a very dangerous idea for the ordinary person to have a Bible that they could read. Why? 
Because as they read the Word of God and they looked around and said, now how we conduct ourselves in the church, what we believe is not true to Scripture. It was a dangerous idea. And you, my dear brother and sister, have the same Bible as I have. And if this pulpit ever becomes a pulpit that does not preach the Word of God in the coming years, I don't know how long I'm going to preach here. People keep asking me, John, when are you going to retire? And I say, do I look old? <laughs> when am I going to retire? Seriously, I'll retire when God's call on my life to preach is rescinded. I will do that gladly. I will, when God confirms, John, it's time for you to stop preaching, I will stop. Ill health can come, different circumstances, but meantime, as God gives me the strength and that calling remains, I will continue to preach and teach the Scriptures. But you as a congregation in the future, if someone were to stand here and preach anything than the Word of God, you, the congregation, irrespective of the leadership, whatever they do, you have a responsibility to stand up and say, no, we are committed to the Word of God. It is my great privilege, as well as a huge responsibility, to be your pastor and week after week to preach the Word. John, in, John Owen says that the preacher must first preach to his own heart. That's one of the things that's difficult to be a preacher. Before I preach to you, I have first to preach to my own heart so that the truth of God is understood by me as I seek to practice it so that we're not just trading in information, but rather the power of the Word of God in my heart, making a change in my heart, and then preaching to you. And my passion is to glorify God through the exposition of His Word. That's the priority of preaching. Father, we thank You for Your Word, Your precious Word. We sang, Speak to me, O God. We thank You. You've given Your Word. And I think and thank You for the preaching of the Word in this church over many years. I think of the, the many faithful preachers of Scripture throughout the world. May You in Your grace raise up many, many more men of courage, men who love Your Word, men who can say, Thus saith the Lord, irrespective of society, irrespective of the persecution, irrespective of what people say, that they will continue to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. Bless us. And I thank You for the many here who preach and teach the Word of God to our children. Thank you for all of these students and boys and girls we saw today. I think of those who teach a youth. Think of the women's Bible studies, the men's Bible studies, the life groups. In so many ways, your word is being opened, and I thank you for that. May all of us who handle your word do it faithfully and allow you to speak. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.